Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to another episode of Muslims Uncensored, the show where we speak unapologetically in support of the religion, the one true religion that we all love the most, Islam. And we also discuss and react to some of the biggest news happening around the world with a specific focus on news of interest to the Muslim world. Now, uh, before we kick off with our discussions, Roshan, um, I think let's discuss last week's show mm -hmm. uh, because it was uh, a change. We did a live stream, which we don't normally do do yeah. and now we've gone back yes. uh, so some people may watch this and be like what's happened there just uh, yeah we're not doing the live streams anymore because I, I felt that last week's show was below our usual standards I thought the presenter was very poor <laughs> I thought the, uh, well, the you, guest you, was you really co-presented so that's yeah it. no I, I wasn't happy with my, with my own performance um, I don't, you weren't particularly happy with your own performance we had lots of technical problems mm. I think uh, we did the show too early and I, I generally I think we don't need to do live streams unless there's a reason to do live streams mm -hmm. uh, where there's an appetite you know if there's something really breaking happening then I think we should do a live stream um, and we'll get a big audience lots of interaction uh, but I think generally this show is working quite well I think people you know yeah. the, the shows that we've done in the past um, you know people have reacted really well to them so I think we should stick with a winning formula yeah uh, for sure so for anyone watching who may wonder why we did a live one week and now we're back to a pre-recorded reaction show that's basically why we're just trying things out it's uh, a new style of show that we're doing and uh, i think we're onto something here i think a lot of people are enjoying watching yeah. uh, so that explains that uh, but let's get into the nitty-gritty because there's a lot to discuss this week a lot of uh, interesting stories um but first of all how are you doing roshan yeah, alhamdulillah, you know, a bit tired, I have to say, it's a bit... Um, this is what people want to know about, is how's Roshan feeling today? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is, like, yeah, the first world problems. I mean, yeah, I mean, look, it's been uh, a month and a half now, and uh, we probably haven't had a break in a month and a half. Uh, now, at the, at the same time, I don't want to complain because you see what's happening in Palestine. Yeah. We ain't going through any of that. Uh, but, you know, just the, the death and disaster every single day. It's hard to kind of be normal, you know, and do normal yeah. things. Like, I'm a big sports fan, but yeah. I haven't watched any football for the last month you and a can't. half, hardly. You just can't. And it feels weird to Generally, watch it. everything else seems very unimportant. And yes. um, it's hard to function normally in this society. And also, I, I feel quite strongly that living in a country where you know at least half the people support a genocide yeah. is quite depressing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it, it does feel now that we're in hostile territory like more so than ever before, simply because people are being plucked off the streets at pro-Palestine protests for holding the wrong sign. Mm. Uh, you don't know if, if what you're saying is even legal anymore. It feel, basically, it feels like it's illegal to support Palestine at the moment. That's how it feels like to me. It's like this hostile, anti-Muslim, anti-Palestine environment that we live in. And the state is like part of that you know you don't know what to say what to do it's really uh and creeping. half the people i think are part of it as well i think i mean obviously we see these demos which are 90 percent non-muslim and hundreds of thousands of people that gives you some hope in the humanity of the people we share these islands with yeah we we run we own the streets i think it's just the establishment really that's um against Palestine and against us, really. Um, but It's um, difficult. I mean, I, I must admit, I think of making Hijra every day. And uh, yeah. I think a lot of British Muslims do as well, because it, it's hard. I have very mixed feelings about this country at the moment uh, and the mm. hostile environment, as you describe it. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Well, let's discuss more about what's going on over in Palestine, uh, Occupy Palestine now, because it seems like uh, the situation is changing. Uh, you've read a little bit more about this, I think, than I have. Mm. Um, but uh, what do you think? Do you think the US is maybe changing its position on its uh, fanatic, radical support yeah. for the genocide in Gaza? It seems like maybe they're trying to rein Israel in. Just tell me where we're at in this conflict. A little bit. Sure. Obviously, since we did the last episode, uh, the Israelis have restarted the war and the bombing and the carpet bombing and the massacre, the genocide uh, of the people of Gaza and they've extended it to the south of Gaza now, whereas yeah, before yeah. it was kind of the ground invasion was limited to the north. Yeah, I do detect a little bit of frustration from the Americans because we all know that Israel is ultimately America's puppet, right? And the only nation in the world that can rein Israel in is, is America. And we've seen a couple of things. There's a poll uh, done by Gallup the other day, which says that about half the American population 
are for the war and half are against. Um, we have Joe Biden with very kind of low ratings, 30 percent, only a year to go before the next presidential election. So I think uh, he's got an eye on that. And the, 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 the massacres which are happening every day are probably playing against Joe Biden now. So he's got his eye on the electoral timetable. So we see some comments from very high U.S. officials saying to Israel, you cannot occupy Gaza. There is too much killing going on. Uh, you cannot go, you know, there has to be a limit and, uh, uh, to, to the end of this war. That's crazy, so isn't it? The America. International Criminal Court, which has always been, the, inter the last thing I want to say, Robert, is the International Criminal Court, which has obviously always ignored Israeli war crimes. Suddenly, the prosecutor there, who's a complete sellout, by the way, he's gone to Ramallah, he's gone to the West Bank, he's telling Israel they can't bomb mosques and hospitals, there will be an investigation, etc., etc. So I do, I do detect some Western disquiet about what's going on which makes me think that the Israelis won't have an open-ended uh, kind of ticket to basically destroy Gaza. There will be some kind of a limit to what they do. It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, it's over uh, 16,000 deaths now, mm. huge numbers of women and children in those figures as well. And still they're dragging their heels. They're just beginning to voice some uh, criticism of Israel for yeah. its behavior. Uh, months and months of uh, slaughter, large widespread slaughter. It, it's unbelievable the, the world we live in basically. And uh, I think that for America, one of the biggest, most genocidal terrorist states on the planet, which is responsible for massive numbers of innocent mm. civilians, for them to be upset with what Israel's doing. I think that speaks volumes, doesn't it, about how bad the Israel is. Well, I was shocked is. when Macron, one of the biggest Islamophobes on the planet, he actually called for a ceasefire as well. So, mm. yeah, you have you have extremists, and I think I think Israel is yeah too extreme for the Americans. That's saying something. <laughs> to, they're they're too extreme for people that have themselves conducted numerous genocides over the last uh, few decades. So, um, do you do you think that this, we're going to see a, a meaningful ceasefire soon? Uh, where do you think this is going? I think perhaps Israel has a month left before America okay. tells them to stop. Wow, um, and imagine how that's many... That's the guess. I could be completely wrong. Imagine how many they've killed in the, the month or so of the conflict, uh, the, the, the genocide, yeah. excuse me, of Gaza that's already happened. The amount of innocent life they've been able to take within that month's space. Yes. If they have one month left and the pressure is piling on, I'm sure they're just going to go in hard. They're they'll going go in as hard kill as possible. As many innocent people as they can. This is the nature of that regime, right? And we've seen them in the past. Yeah. When they know the clock's ticking on how much violence they can commit, yes. they go in hard. They smash and Absolutely. destroy and kill as many people as they can. This is the Israeli regime. So uh, we need to seriously pray for Gaza, man. Uh, I know we're already doing it, but uh, I don't know how many more innocent lives are going to be lost. I really fear for that. Uh, let's talk about something because uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know how we're going to address this, but Israel are uh, known for a number of things, yeah. uh, stealing land, uh, killing, killing kids in Gaza, uh, but also lying. I think that's something which they're quite known for and it's winding them up because no one is believing the allegations, such as rape allegations, which are being made uh, time and again over the past couple of mm. weeks. And it's been getting more intense. They, they're saying they're releasing more and more evidence now. But actually, when you look at the so-called evidence, it's not very compelling uh, to yeah. have more erosion. Well, as you said at the start, you know, the lying is second nature to these people. I mean, they were saying that babies had been raped and beheaded right at the beginning. They've, they've backtracked on that, but they quietly backtrack. They, yeah. they get the allegations out and then quietly they delete tweets and stuff like that. They don't the actually own... The mainstream media gobbles it up as well. Yeah. Anything that comes the out The damage is done. The damage yeah, is done. absolutely. And then they retract later in a quiet way and stuff mm. like that. Uh, I Fake mean, news. these rape Fake allegations news. are ridiculous. I mean, I, we can't swear on this program. If I, if I could swear, I <laughs> Would, but they're, they're BS. Let's yeah, just say yeah, that they yeah, are yeah. complete BS. Yeah. And just just think about it logically. I mean, first of all, the the so-called evidence is not people that have been raped themselves, but it's it's family members or so-called eyewitnesses, and it's people that have collected but it's sold Israeli soldiers. So I would I would just dismiss that them as liars. I I, I consider any Israeli Zionist to be a liar. So I, I would take no evidence from them whatsoever. They are literally genocide 
genocide supporters, and I believe they are trying to build a case uh, for genocide and deflect away from genocide. But think about it logically, Robert, or the viewers, think about this logically. Now, I know we are not allowed to glorify Hamas or praise Hamas, so obviously we're going to adhere to those rules. But think about it logically. These are people who are devout Muslims, you know, and they believe in Islam. So rape is haram. It's a crime. It's a heinous crime. Now, not only are they accusing them of raping women, they're accusing them of raping men as well. Homosexuality. I mean, we all know th th this is something that's used against Hamas again and again, that they, they, they consider homosexuality to be a crime, a heinous crime. So you're saying that, you know, they're going to jettison all their values, all their principles and go on a rape rampage, <laughs> you know? And I mean, how do they find the time to kill people because they're so busy raping people, you know? I mean, this is ridiculous. This <laughs> absolutely ridiculous and it's there to build a case for war and genocide mm. and to deflect people's attention and the fact that the mainstream media is gobbling up this bs is an absolute disgrace and makes me think we shouldn't believe anything they say either well yeah absolutely i mean one of the articles that we've got here is from the bbc uh, I'm sorry, but the BBC probably makes the allegations even less credible, the fact that they're reporting on it. And nowhere in the article, by the way, does it actually provide any hard evidence for the claims. It just no. quotes uh, alleged things that have happened. Uh, the fact is we don't know really what happened on October the 7th. Um, there's allegations all over the place. Uh, we know uh, bits and pieces of what happened, but we don't know. And especially when Israel comes out with all of these allegations, which basically are trying to say that Palestinians are evil, backwards, barbaric savages. That's what they're trying to push with the this so-called evidence, uh, this narrative. Now, why would they want that narrative out there? Why would they want people to believe that? It's because they want to facilitate their genocide mm. against the Palestinians. How can you do that? By convincing the general public that Palestinians are all terrorists, they're all rapists, they're all killers, and they all deserve nothing more than, than death basically. Uh, so the fact that no one can look at this story and say, well, maybe it, the Israeli authorities have a vested interest in dehumanizing and spreading lies yeah. about Palestinians, especially people in Gaza right now, uh, and not go, hmm, maybe there's something wrong here. Maybe we do need to wait for hard evidence before we actually go with these stories. Uh, I don't, uh, they, again, it, like you said, I don't believe uh, Western mainstream media. Yeah. I mean, two things before maybe we move on to another topic, and that is that uh, if it was true, surely there'd be forensic evidence. You know, uh, I mean, I don't want to be too explicit about this, but surely there'd be, you know, DNA evidence uh, that they could extract. And also, don't forget that um, Hamas has held female Israeli captives inside Gaza for several weeks. So if they were on a rape rampage on October the 7th, surely they would have raped those hostages, those captives as mm. well. Um, but as we know, they've all come out of Gaza uh, smiling and saying great treatment. So it just doesn't make any sense, Robert. We can't talk about uh, facts uh, as journalists, as uh, experts on the region. You can't speak about facts. You've just got to go with this crazy pro-Israel narrative, which is basically just uh, painting all Palestinians as terrorists. Yeah. And if you don't do that, then somehow you're a terrorist sympathizer. That's how stupid and ridiculous and pathetic uh, the debate, so-called debate surrounding what's going on in Occupied Palestine is. Uh, speaking of liars, I want to uh, <laughs> dive into uh, another area here which is related to this. Israel's ambassador in the UK uh, has actually been caught out by Sky News, okay. basically making stuff up on air, yeah. so peddling lies. I'll, I'll play out a little clip just so we can all see exactly what uh, she's been up to. Uh, so here's a little clip from Sky News. The river, there is a place in Gaza called the Muasi. The Muasi is the place where they all can have shelters. Uh, together with international organizations, we created shelters for the Palestinian people. No, so you cannot no. say Israel is not you know, no, facilitating but, that. But together with humanitarian aid. This is where she's talking about. A desolate wasteland of sand dunes next to the Mediterranean Sea. There is no aid in Al Muasi. There are no aid agency tents. There are no food kitchens. There is no help here. So there you go. Yeah. I mean, uh, she just basically uh, her name is uh, Zippy to Zippy to Zippy Hotavelli, uh, I think. And basically, she is uh, known for making stuff up, quite frankly. Uh, she said things which are outrageous. 
And uh, this is the latest, most embarrassing example where she's gone on British TV yeah. and she's just said things which are just factually untrue. And she just assumes that no one would call her out on it or check or mm. investigate because I guess she assumed that everyone in uh, the mainstream in the West will just gobble up everything that Israel says. But on this occasion, uh, even they had to double check that and yeah. they found that she was a complete and utter liar, barefaced liar, in fact. It's interesting how the mainstream media seems to be turning against Israel a little bit as well. Not a lot, but a little bit. I, 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 I've seen a tone shift slightly. Even uh, Alex Crawford, the Sky News correspondent, I think she tweeted yesterday that she couldn't get into Gaza. Israel was preventing uh, journalists from getting into Gaza to hide their war crimes. Egypt was collaborating as well with the Israelis, preventing, you know, and she was expressing sympathy with the, the Gazan journalists that were being murdered. So there's a slight tone shift even from the mainstream media towards Israel now as well. Yeah, and I have to say that I think it's, it's just because they have no respect for this thing. You know, they have no respect. They don't go on to, I mean, Western mainstream media gives Israel so much support, mm. quite frankly. They support Israel's narratives, they push Israeli propaganda and lies all the time, uh, they platform individuals like uh, Tazipi is actually condemned and has been condemned as being a, 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 a far-right nutter, uh, nutter. anti-Arab racist, yeah. uh, a Holocaust denier, quite frankly. She denies the Nakba ever ex even oh, right, happened. Yeah. Right, she right. just says it, it never happened. Uh, that's the Palestinian yeah. uh, Holocaust as we know it. Uh, she just says it, she says it was an Arab lie. She goes around saying that it was an Arab lie, that Arabs lie about everything, including the Nakba, She's an when actually the one who's been caught out lying, coincidentally, is her on TV. So, you know, she's a nutter, and I think even some journalists now are starting yeah. to see what she's doing, and Zippy, even they um, don't appreciate it, you know? I, I can't pronounce her last name, so I'm just going to call her Zippy and Bungle. Zippity doo uh, zip, Zippy <laughs> hologram, Zippy, I don't know. Zippy, anyway, Zippy and Bungle, basically she's an extremist. <laughs> Uh, you know, I remember a couple of years ago writing articles about her on Five Pillars when she was uh, appointed mm -hmm. the Zionist ambassador to the UK. And uh, there were lots of Zionist uh, Jews that were against that appointment, by the way. Mm. Uh, people that believe in the state of Israel, etc., because they know her reputation back home. I think she's intimately involved with the settler movement. Uh, I think she's involved with a movement that wants to, the Temple Man movement, I think it's called, to take, take back Al-Aqsa Mosque, to destroy Al-Aqsa Mosque. Yeah. She is known in Israel itself for being an extremist mm. um, who comes out with outrageous rhetoric uh, and she's proven to be a massive liability as Israeli ambassador. That's actually good for us because it shows the true face of Israel. Yeah and I have to say I, I remember as well because when she was appointed she went on a, a sort of lecturing tour to many universities. I think they were trying to platform and normalize her basically right. and uh, as is often the case many British students uh, are very pro-Palestine. They know what's right and wrong, basically. And they condemned and protested against her appearances yeah. in universities, uh, like the London School of Economics. And uh, she went on mainstream media and smeared them all as anti-Semites. Uh, she said that they threatened her and that she was in danger or something like that. It was all sorts of ridiculous, stupid Chuck. things. And I attended many of those protests. And OK, yeah, they condemned her in a lively way, but that's called a protest. And if she wants to be an ambassador of a regime that kills kids, yeah. an apartheid regime like Israel, and she what she expects just to be given the red carpet treatment by ordinary people around the world, I'm sorry, no, but uh, we're not going to... Yeah, it's like stupid to, to say that. She's but she, a joke. She is. Default position, uh, Robert, Israeli officials are liars. <laughs> Check everything they say. Don't believe any, Your default position should be not to believe anything they say. Occasionally, one in a million, they might tell the truth. But even when they tell the truth, just check it. Just verify. <laughs> well, Liars. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, that's a good strong ending on that particular uh, topic for the, uh, the, the, the the Zionist land whale that is Tzipi Hotavelli. Uh, let's go to uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> let's go to someone else who's uh, been in the news lately. Uh, Mehdi Hassan. You, you mm. know Mehdi Hassan. Many I know him personally. Do. Yes. Uh, his show on MSNBC has been cancelled. It's not exactly clear why, but many many people are saying it, it's probably because he's been expressing support for yeah. Palestine amid the ongoing genocide has, there yes. and uh, obviously in his interviews he's been holding you know Israeli officials to account and calling them out on things uh, that might be the reason basically he's a, a
quote unquote Muslim voice in Western media. Yeah. And right now, I think Western media is very scared of any Muslim presence in mainstream circles in case they do say something that they don't like against Israel. Yeah. Um, but basically, Mehdi Hassan, I think a lot of people are not really very sympathetic to his cancellation no, from our not. community. No, I think no. it's because of things that Mehdi's done in the past. Perhaps uh, you actually know Mehdi, yes. don't you? You've worked with him in the past. Yes. Just, uh, yeah, just uh, tell us about I that. I worked Richard. with him at London Weekend Television where we, we were both um, very young in our 20s. Uh, he's about five years younger than me, I think. Um, it was obvious that he was a very, very intelligent person. An Oxford graduate, really a high flyer right from the beginning. Everyone knew that this was the guy that was going to make it in the media and go on to earn loads of money, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. He really did stand out. Uh, we got on really well, and uh, we bonded over football. He sported England. I wanted England to lose, uh, of course. <laughs> and we used to have endless debates about football. Yeah, he was, he's a very mainstream kind of Muslim. You know, very kind of. Um, you know, believes in, in Britain and believes in the West and stuff like that. Uh, critical, like a critical friend, whereas I was kind of very anti-West in, in my rhetoric. Uh, so we disagreed a lot, but we got on quite well. Uh, and that is probably why I'm, I'm a bit hesitant to kind of go in too hard on Mehdi Hassan because we always got on well. He was a, a nice person to me, always has been. Um, but yeah, putting aside all that, um, yeah, he's taken some positions which basically go against Islam. Like, you know, um, I think he supported gay marriage and he apologized for anti-LGBT comments he made. Obviously, if you're a Muslim, you, you can't do that. And and I think he's seen as very kind of mainstream um, in his rhetoric, um, in his outlook. He's, he's like controlled opposition. So, you know, he's critical of the Western status quo, but it just doesn't go past a certain red line, whereas I think you and me would, you mm. know? And um, I think a lot of Muslims have felt betrayed because of that. Mm. And uh, that's why there's not a lot of sympathy for him. I'm and a yeah, the, the last thing I would say is, that, you know, a, a, a wider point about the media, I think no Muslim can be allowed to really express their true feelings on mainstream media. Um, so I would say that, you know, no matter how much money you're earning, how famous you are, how big a platform you are, uh, you cannot go past a certain red line on mainstream media. And one of those red lines is Israel-Palestine. You know, you cannot be too critical of Israel and Zionism. And Mehdi's found that out to his cost. And um, that's why, that's why you know, we have to, we can't rely on mainstream media. We've got to support independent Muslim media. Yeah, and I, I have to say, I, I'm, I'm probably going to be less generous to Mehdi here because I don't know him. Yeah. Um, uh, but what I've seen of him, I've not been very impressed with, to be honest with you. I think he has basically pursued to please uh, Western liberal. Oh, here we go again. Another call for Roshan. This I'm is, definitely uh, not going to answer that one. <laughs> is it? Uh, I don't know who it is, actually. Yeah, I'm sorry. I is hardly it get any. Is it I hardly, yeah, yeah, I hardly get any calls, <laughs> but I just get them during this show. Yeah. Well, so. uh, uh, it's always through my talking points, so thanks for that. Uh, what was I saying now? So Mehdi Hassan is, uh, yeah, basically, I think he's, he's pursued his career interest, which is to please liberal Western secular mm. non-Muslims, quite Jeremy frankly. Jeremy Corbyn fans. Uh, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, don't get me started with Jeremy Corbyn again. Uh, <laughs> but basically, yeah, Mehdi Hassan has pursued a career. I call it going Hollywood, yeah. where basically he's um, tried to please a Western audience who are by and large liberal, uh, lefties, non-Muslim, many mm. of them. And in doing so, he's had to compromise on his Islamic beliefs in some cases. He's had to uh, become liberal and secular in his uh, uh, pursuit Sona, and I think that he's actually done damage to uh, the Muslim cause in the sense. And I think he's also in a way done damage to the Palestinian cause. Yeah. And I'll tell you why. Uh, he's done what a lot of lefties and liberals have done, including here in the UK. He's fed into the um, anti-Semitism allegation yes, uh, game plan, uh, the weaponizing of anti-Semitism against people that you don't like. That Liberals do that, even though it damages them as well in the end. And that's exactly what... Uh, maybe damaging Mehdi Hassan now as his mm. comments on Palestine have led to him being censored potentially. But he's happy to go on Twitter and accuse everyone that he doesn't like, including Elon Musk and others, of being anti-Semites and feeding into this whole weaponizing of the uh, accusation thing. And uh, he's, he's, he's said a lot of damaging things. I mean, he, he fed into uh, this idea that British Muslims, this is an article he wrote many years ago, that British Muslims have a, a deep-rooted problem with anti-Semitism. Yes, he did. And that's something which 
Islamophobes to this day Bring up. quote, I forget what he said exactly. He said something like it's, it's our dirty a dirty little secret. Dirty little secret. They were all basically anti Semites. Douglas Murray, who, yeah. I'm sh who I know Mehdi Hassan wouldn't like or support or have anything to do with Douglas Murray, uh, but Douglas Murray quotes Mehdi Hassan all the time when mm. attacking Muslims like us. And I think that Mehdi Hassan is part of a, a conspiracy in Western media to silence decent Muslim voices like ours mm. because uh, they platform liberal sellouts like him and they use him as the quote-unquote Muslim voice in Western yeah, media. I mean, I, I, we represent the proper Muslim journalistic voice in Western media yeah. more than him actually. Oh, we, yeah, we, don't yeah, no, out, we don't sell out no. even the controversial parts yeah. of Islam which Western look, liberals don't look, like. I think uh, people will say look Robert and Roshan you don't represent the Muslim <laughs> community either but uh, what I would say to people is that we are people who like spend all our lives with Muslims and we travel all over the country. And especially we don't apologise for Islam. Yeah. Yeah. beliefs yeah we don't apologize for Islamic and, beliefs right, we're, to we're, uh, we're not we're not saying we're perfect human beings we're far from perfect but yeah you know the Quran is our constitution the the Sunnah is what we 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 seek to emulate um, could you say the same for Mehdi Hassan in his private and public life I'm not sure and he hasn't even um, I mean he should have resigned shouldn't he I mean literally he's been slapped down by these guys they took away his show now he's like some poxy analyst <laughs> um, but he still hasn't resigned he, the guy he should he should resign at least all that boot licking and all he's got now but is he must, yeah, be on, a, he must be on a the Kuala Wonga, right? I, I assume uh, he's on a million a year at least. Again, you know? it doesn't serve his reputation very well, does it? Um, Mehdi Hassan, sorry, mate, but yeah, I'm not very impressed. Uh, I have to say, we don't need to listen to, is, to Mehdi Hassan. This has been a long time coming, perhaps. So I don't know. Will you learn lessons? I don't know about that. Uh, like, I would say the last thing I say is like, because I want to cast Jeremy Corbyn again. No, no, so, <laughs> but, but like Jeremy Corbyn, <laughs> as well, we're on no, a roll. No, no. Like, like Jeremy Corbyn, I think Mehdi Hassan is someone that we can use to amplify certain messages at particular times. He can be useful because he's got mm. a huge platform. He's yeah. got a million people on Twitter. He's got just got a very big platform. So yeah. let's use him uh, when appropriate. But I mean, let's also kind of not, he's not our teacher, he's not our leader. You know? here's, a, here's an awkward question. Uh, Hamza Youssef, there have been accusations Which against one, the, him. The, uh, the Hamza Youssef, the, the, the Scottish um, politician, uh, Muslim politician in Scotland, head of the uh, Scottish yeah. National Party. That's who I'm referring to, just to clarify. He has been condemned by many Muslims. In fact, some members of our community have actually excommunicated him. Right. Um, I won't you. wait. <laughs> not, not me, I'm far you from qualified. Be, yeah. I'm far from qualified to do anything like that. But he's under a lot of pressure because of saying things very similar to what Mehdi Hassan has apologized for, uh, such as, you know, same sex uh, marriage, the defense of it, yeah. saying that it's okay. Now he was condemned because he went against key Islamic beliefs here. Yeah. And people actually wanted to yeah, excommunicate Kuffer, him. Statements of Kuffer, yeah. Has Mehdi Hassan been guilty of that? It's very similar. Um, I think I think Mehdi Hassan has made statements of kufr. Yeah, whether you can call him a kafir for that uh, is is, a, is something yeah. for the scholars. But he's definitely made statements of kufr. Ooh, yes. There's Corporate. no doubt about that. It's clear. Mm. You know, if you say that uh, you don't believe in uh, the um, or you don't follow Islamic teachings on LGBT, then that's a statement of kufr. Yes, I just. But it doesn't mean you're a kafir because people can say things out of ignorance or stuff like that. So that's why you need to get the. Um, it's very difficult because he knew what he was saying, doesn't he? I mean, he he wanted to be. Um, well, uh, if you want to make Chuck fear live on air, then, then I'm not qualified. That's up to you. I'm I not qualified. I'm not going to do that. I'm yeah. just asking questions. That's what we do in Muslims just, Uncensored. I'm just asking questions. Yeah, just putting it out there. Just putting it out there. Yeah, why there. not? Let's have a discussion about it. Um, but yeah, I'll leave it to scholars. I'm not going to go out of my lane here. Uh, final question: What do you make of his uh, famous interview that he did with? It was a debate with Richard Dawkins oh, yes. on Islam. Uh, a lot of people say that that was like his one of his greatest moments. But what well, do you I've, make? I've not watched all of it, but I watched the bit where Richard Dawkins asked him about uh, the. Burak, you know, the, the night journey uh, to the heavens. And Richard Dawkins was was basically taunting him and saying, oh, you believed in a winged horse and stuff like mm. that. And again, Mehdi Hassan failed to kind of, you know, he, he kind of said, oh, no, I can't prove it. He was very defensive. And I don't know. He just, I mean, I mean he, say, he says some good things about Islam. May Allah guide him to the right path. Mm. Um, I don't hate the guy, but he's just not my teacher. 
Yes. Uh, in that, that, I thought that was quite embarrassing, basically. Yeah. Uh, and he didn't defend the Islamic position very well. Yeah, he was probably worried about saying his liberal mates in uh, yeah. MSNBC. I believe we believe in the with the Barack. I mean, Richard Dawkins would say a, a winged horse, you know, uh, very negatively. But we believe in miracles. Uh, yeah. But but there's a reason why we believe in miracles. We believe in miracles because we believe uh, in Allah, and we believe that He is the Almighty and He can do everything. We believe the Quran uh, is you know the word of Allah. We believe the Prophet spoke the Haq, the truth. So there's a reason why we believe in these miracles. Um, but obviously, if you divorce it from that context, mm. then from a secular mind, it sounds stupid. But Mehdi Hassan didn't explain all this. Well, I think Richard Dawkins is the one who sounds stupid. He wants people to believe that something came from nothing. Yeah. This complex, beautiful uh, world that we live in came from nothing. It was by chance, by a coincidence. I've always said atheism is the dumbest position. It's so you dumb. Know, literally, it's, so it's dumb. the dumbest position. It's, and we it's, a, it's a smart religion for dumb people, basically. That's uh, and we I treat these guys with respect, and they want us to believe that you know something came out of nothing. I mean, where did this <laughs> chair come from? It came out, it just appeared suddenly. You know, I mean, they're thick. Atheists are thick. Yeah, for sure. Uh, okay, let, 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 we, let's give Mehdi Hassan a break, because, uh, yeah, I think we've got to... We've got to do a whole episode on atheists. Just cussing yeah, atheists. Yeah, the, the next ones we've got to hit. Uh, but let's end um, the final topic of the show, because uh, something quite serious is happening here in the UK. So let's get serious for a moment, if we can, Roshan. Uh, the UK police have charged mm. someone who attended a pro-Palestine demonstration recently because they held up a sign, a placard, which said, Israel burn in hell. Roshan, they what's were your convicted. They, they weren't just charged, they were convicted. They were convicted. And they had to pay a fine or whatever. So there's some background to this. Basically, this is a trans person from Saudi Arabia uh, who's a refugee in this country. And um, they, was it he, she, they? I, I don't know. I'm going to get accused of misgendering people here, but let's just say they. They came over to the UK and don't speak English very well, allegedly picked up this sign saying Israel burn in hell and got really worried about what this could you know, mean for them. And they wanted to um, basically be guilty. So they pled, this person should not have pled guilty to this charge because holding a sign up saying Israel burn in hell, I don't think is a criminal offense. I'm not a lawyer, but I've consulted a few lawyers about this. It's not a, it's not a criminal offense. The reason why this person was convicted is because they pled guilty when they shouldn't have. So I'm wondering about the legal advice they got, or I think that maybe they insisted on pleading guilty and therefore the lawyer has to go along with that. It can't go against the client's wishes. But, but this has possible chilling effects. This will scare people. It will square people into thinking they can't hold up this sign. Now I understand there's a public order Act where you can't target individuals. So if I said Robert Carter burn in hell, then possibly that's an offense, you know, because that's mm. possibly it's encouraging violence. Yeah. But Israel, the apartheid state of Israel, you know, that is, you know, uh, if I if I said, I don't know, Liechtenstein burn in hell, that's that's not an offense, you know? It's a, it's, yeah, it's a country. It, it's, it's a like, country, it's not an individual. It's crazy, so isn't it? That I'm you, really worried about this, you know? It's crazy. You can get convicted for criticizing a country. How crazy is that? And uh, Sorry, no, speaking of crazy, Roshan's phone going off again. That must be Mehdi Hassan. I know that's Mehdi Hassan. He's, this is like an old joke now. <laughs> he's trying to silence us. We are not it goes deliberately out. doing this so that we can make a, take a phone call. I feel call like on you air. might be deliberately doing no, it. No, I'm not. Trying I to just... censor me on uncensored. Yeah, yeah. But uh, what, what can I say? Yeah, we, we live in a time where a country, a specific country, what, you'd get convicted for criticizing it? I mean, what a crazy situation that, that we're in now. You can't criticize a country because you well, might just get Well, just Israel. Convicted. If you criticize any other country, it'd be fine. Just Israel, I think. No, no, I think, I think, I think the police, what there's a, a, a general point to be made here. The police are overreaching. They're under a lot of political pressure to crack down on pro-Palestine activism, to arrest people. Uh, this is coming from, you know, the politicians and the media and right-wing crazies and Zionists, quite frankly. And the police are overreaching. They are arresting people for offenses which are not offences, like saying Zionists are terrorists, uh, Arabic banners, which they don't understand, calling people coconuts. You know, this is, the police are not there to regulate our language. You know, they are there to keep order and to prevent violence. So obviously if something does stray into incitement for violence, then I can understand people, uh, the police arresting people, but these do not constitute incitement for violence. This is about, you know, supporting the Palestinians and opposing a genocide. Um, so 
we really need to make a big deal out of this. I mean, they even want to ban from the river to the sea. You know, I think it's, it's it, enough is enough. The police need to back off. Yeah, because it's like I said earlier in the show, it's starting to feel like it's almost illegal to support Palestine at all. It's it's almost illegal to basically support Palestine. Mm. To, I mean, what's next? Are they going to arrest me for holding a Palestine flag? I mean, there was a, a, a sim, a, someone was um, carted off for allegedly holding a Palestine flag in Manchester uh, several weeks back. Uh, they weren't like charged or convicted of anything, as far as I understand. But it's this like, what do the the police already wonder? Like, why do minorities in this country not trust us? Why were why don't they want to talk to us? Why don't they want to interact or uh, uh, work with us in any sense of the word? And that's because like of this like they, they're literally it's like a police state it's yeah. like the uk is a police state and they're like frightening people to stand up for a morally a righteous cause like uh, the occupied people of palestine like how that is the biggest crime isn't it is that uh, the occupier zionism has somehow been allowed to become the victim how can I occupy someone and then be the victim somehow? And then anyone who speaks out against it gets like charged and arrested here. Mm. What a crazy country this is. I think people will conclude very shortly that some kind of civil disobedience is going to become necessary, akin to, you know, Rosa Parks and the bus in Alabama, the civil rights movement, and, you know, South Africa and opposing anti apartheid South Africa, because they are trying to criminalize calling out a genocide in this country. Um, so if that lands people with fines, with convictions, even in jail, I think sooner or later, Muslims in this country are gonna conclude then that is the price we're gonna have to pay. But uh, yeah, this uh, trans uh, Saudi uh, person, I, I hope You've they- You've been very careful with your language here now, aren't you? I don't know, I mean, there's a hundred <laughs> different genders now or something like that. Yeah. What should I do, list all of them just so I don't offend anyone? Uh, but whatever. But, I hope they know just how damaging and stupid and annoying this whole affair has been for the yes. Palestinian cause. Yes. That, that idiot has now set a very dangerous precedent which favours uh, the pro-Israel apologists, favours the authorities here in their crackdown on the Palestinian yeah. Police cause. Police are boasting about this. Whoever you are, I think that their name is uh, Laura now, uh, something Laura like that. Davis Laura, Davis, Laura like Davis or Lucy Davis. Laura Davis, you have literally done so much damage. I hope you know that. I hope you know that. The damage you've done, just don't go to a Palestine march anymore. Whatever weird little protest you wanted to do, don't just don't show up, just stay home and do your thing. You know, the damage you've done, I can't believe how stupid you've behaved. Uh, I'm so angry, I'll, I'll leave it there. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think now, Roshan, might be a time to emphasize to our viewers that now is the time for bravery Yes. Uh, it's not the time to get scared, especially when the police are overstretching, as you say. Uh, let's remember Malcolm X. Let's remember uh, Nelson Mandela, what they went through uh, in order to achieve success mm. in the end. Allah tests us with hardships, but then later comes ease. This is part of our beliefs. And the Palestinian cause needs us now more than ever. Yeah. And we need brave champions. This is not the time um, for cowardice. It's not the time for mice. It's the time for lions, you know? And um, yeah, there is no effective activism which does not come at a personal cost. You cannot think, brothers and sisters, that you can do activism without getting any heat. If you don't get any heat, that means your activism is not effective, as simple as that. For sure. Uh, Roshan, I think uh, before we end the show, is there anything you want to discuss? No. Nope. Uh, we've got... Uh, <laughs> no. Nope. Let's end the show. <laughs> we, what, 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 great what discussion. Uh, well, I know you like to uh, give your audience a lovely update about how things are going. Uh, tell us about Five Pillars. We're uh, doing well now, aren't we? We're uh, expanding. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, unfortunately, whenever there's a crisis, Five Pillars gets more traction. I mean, I'd rather not have the crisis and not have our brothers die and Five Pillars can just be on an even keel. But no, I think uh, obviously over the past uh, month and a half, you know, we've reached ten tens of millions of people. I mean, yeah. even that one video we did on the genocide um, that our colleague Hassan put together um, on, on, on genocide, that has in, in itself reached tens of millions of people all around the world. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think... I mean, again, I, I don't want to beg for money or anything like that, but, you know, brothers and sisters, you have to support us. You know, yeah. who's going to save you? Mehdi Hassan? No. Uh, who's going to support you? Jeremy Corbyn? No. You know, literally, you know, uh, I, think, I think people now realise... Uh, we've always had our, our loyal supporters at Five Pillars. Alhamdulillah, the Ummah has always supported us. But I think now more people realize mm. the strategic necessity of Muslim media, you Absolutely, know, yeah. um, because 
we ain't got anybody else. Who, who else is there that's gonna, that's gonna you know, yeah. even other Muslim channels, do they really do the job? I think that's a strong ending because, yeah, Five Pillars, we're unique, uh, we're unapologetic, uh, we stand up for Islam, even the so-called controversial stuff, we don't apologise or appease, mm. uh, especially on important issues like the Palestinian cause, uh, the Gaza genocide, and we provide a safe space for Muslims, proper Muslims, unapologetic <laughs> Muslims. <laughs> real to, Muslims. Uh, yeah, real Muslims, <laughs> uh, to, to, uh, to, to air their views, basically. Um, and I think that that's incredibly important. I think we've got a lot of potential to still do better, but Absolutely. we rely, we're a grassroots uh, platform, so we rely- We will on, never take any money from a state or someone with a sectarian interest or a political interest. We want to be funded by people. I mean, the people that fund us, I don't know who they are. They're, they're your average Muhammad or Aisha or Fatima, you know, from Birmingham, from Bradford. I don't know them personally, who are giving five pounds a month, 10 pounds a month. There is one thing I wanted to ask the audience perhaps, is what do you think about the idea of kind of sticking to this format and, uh, you know, not doing a live stream? Perhaps people can leave in the comments, uh, you know, there. Yeah. I personally don't want to do a live stream anymore, apart from emergencies, yeah. but let's, let's say from the audience. I like it, we do get good feedback and we do actually view it as well and occasionally reply as well. So yeah, do please uh, leave your thoughts and comments in the comment section below. Uh, I think I'll end the show there. Thank you yes, very much, Roshan Saleh. Uh, we'll be like back okay. again next week, inshallah. And uh, thank you for everyone at home for tuning in and watching. Please like, share and subscribe. It really helps the channel immensely and support Five Pillars in any way that you can, including just sharing our stuff as widely as possible when it goes out there. Thank you very much, guys. And until next week, it's Masalama and Salam for now.